recording in three, two, and one. Hey, has anybody told Greg we're finally doing a metal episode? I did. Hey, excellent. This list should melt his face off. Love you, Greg. Awesome. Welcome to episode 118 of Nerdery and Murdery. Big 118. I'm Zig with your Nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with the Murdery. With the Murdery. Welcome to another week's the highs and lows, the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, and the nerd and the murd. Um, you know, moving, moving to South Texas, it's a different life down here. Yes. Um, one of the things, one of the things about being down here is an incredible amount of the people here just don't give a shit and are lazy. So. Yesterday, I'm at the grocery That's a bold store. statement. It's very true, though. The slower it's, pace of life. Uh, I, I don't know if that's what it is. But yesterday, I'm at the grocery store. And I get back to my car after getting my groceries. And I'm, I'm in my parking space. Directly in front of me is a car. Directly to the left of that car is the shopping cart stall where you return shopping carts. Yes. So as I'm sitting there, because I, <clears throat> I have to send a text home, let Chelsea know I'm on the way home because um, to get into our house, we have an, we have an automatic gate and I want to make sure that the dogs aren't out. So I let her know I'm coming home. They, I'm, I'm only a few minutes from the grocery store. So let her know I'm okay. coming home. So she puts the dogs in, blah, blah, blah. So I'm sitting there yeah. texting. Makes sense. The people in the car in front of me come up, put their groceries up, and then proceed to put the shopping cart in front of my car. <laughs> There's a corral right there. Yeah. Right there. Directly to their left. And I watch them get in their car, pull out, and leave. And I'm there stunned for a minute. <laughs> Another family comes up into the car that was to the right of them. Uh huh. They see the shopping cart, and they walk over to it, and they move it just slightly so that they won't hit it. And then they get in their car and leave. And the corral is right there. The corral is right there fucking there i was like are you fucking kidding me yeah, unbelievable a lot, of, a lot of people say that the uh, the the shopping cart corral is a test of uh your <laughs> you, is a test of of whether or not you're a <clears throat> you're a caring person or not because it doesn't cost you anything to put things no. in. yeah yeah you, you so, know if if the cart was across the lot or several rows down you know, maybe I understand a little bit, but the corral was just right there. The amount of effort that it took for them to move it just a bit would have been the same effort to put it into the corral. Yes. 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 So 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 that that's just that's just that's how lazy people are down here. <laughs> it, it's just it, it's that's just one of many examples. I am so sorry. Just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Oh my god. I did finish Andor though finally. Okay. Um that, it was just too slow throughout and I didn't like the ending. I didn't like the ending of it at all. Uh I felt the ending left a lot to be desired and we never really got any payoff of the political intrigue with Mon Mothma and I overall, I was not overly happy with Andor. I powered through it and I watched it. Um, we did watch all of Moon Knight. Uh huh. I liked Moon Knight. Moon Knight's great. Um. Uh. Again, I it's, I I kind of thought the ending left a little bit to be desired, but I did enjoy Moon Knight. That yeah. was that yeah, was. Yeah, but I mean, the ending for Moon Knight makes sense in that dude's story. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. I hope there's a season two because um, I, I I really enjoyed that. I think there's going to be a season two of Moon Knight. I think that's the plan, and a season two of Andor. Yeah, I know there's a season two of Andor. I, kn I know that for sure. And then with the Marvels movie coming out in November, we started watching Miss Marvel. 
that's a little bit of a slow burn too. Yeah, yeah. It's ri- No one ever talks about the partition in India, mm-hmm. which is a fascinating period of history. Mm-hmm. You know, because it was so horrific. But I love that they basically just they drop a couple of episodes in the middle of it. Yeah, I'm only we're only uh, not quite through with episode two yet, uh, oh. and they've talked about the partition. Yeah. A, a little bit, but haven't really gone into much, much detail of it, but they've talked about it. So anyway, anything new with you? Uh, we went and saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Did that you? That was a blast. 40, yeah. 40th, 40th anniversary? Yes. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Which is weird because it was released in 75, so. Um, but yeah, there uh, it was. It was a lot of fun. We we saw the lost lost Bastardos group. Mm, that's would, a good. That's a good group. You and I have yeah. seen them multiple times. Yeah, they were a lot of fun. Um, you know, when they pulled the sheet back for for exposing Eddie, I stood up and said, "His name is Robert Paulson," and there was a guy in the in the aisle turned to me right and said, "No, that's Bob with bitch tits," and went on with a with a diatribe on that. I don't remember what he said after that because I was laughing so hard. How funny. I was like, oh, my God. And then and when that was over, he slapped me on the back. He was like, you're an old head, aren't you? That's funny. Awesome. Well, Zig, with that, I will let you take over on the nerdery side of the house. Okie dokie. This one's going to be kind of a long one. Matter of fact, I had to break it up into two. You know, before when we did the the DFW indie scene, and I was like, I need to, I need two episodes to explain this. Mm-hmm. It's the same for the East Bay indie scene because there were two different schools of music that were going on. And what's weird is there were actually two bands that kind of crossed in between those those uh, those two genres. But they were all going – sometimes they would play in the same clubs on the same nights. You had this pop punk sound, which gives us stuff like Green Day, and you had this thrash metal, which gave us Metallica. Mm-hmm. Same time, same period, all the stuff's going on. The two bands that crossed over, Primus and The Donnas. Yeah, it's weird. Um. But the first one is going to be about the thrash metal scene in, in, in the East Bay of San Francisco. Or <sighs> East Bay would be Oakland, Berkeley, uh, Alameda County. Uh, so you got all these, all, these little towns like Pine Hall and uh, basically how it's explained by Kurt Hammett very well. Uh, this is where all the dirt bags lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. We kind of formed a couple of music scenes around that. So we're going to start with, with Thrash. The earliest documented roots of the Bay Area Thrash scene date back to the formation of Exodus in 1979. By the time the gr- r- group recorded their, uh, their full-length album uh, four years later, five different guitarists or bassists had already passed through the lineup with some going on to join, join or form bands that were equally relevant to the area's burgeoning metal scene. In November of 1982, Exodus opened a show at San Francisco's old Waldorf venue for Metallica, a then relatively unknown and unsigned band from Southern California who were recently discovered by Brian Slagle and had appeared on the first volume of his Metal Maskers compilation. Exodus, who was unsigned at the time, had distributed an untitled demo that same year with a lineup that included guitarist Kurt Hammett. Um, And although Metallica had initially formed in Los Angeles, it was not until February of 83 when they relocated to the East Bay Area uh, because they wanted the bassist Cliff Burton, and he said, I'm not moving to L.A. If you you want me to be in your band, you got to move up here. So they did. Um... So the, the, the band consisted of Cliff Burton, James Hetfield, Lars, Lars Ulrich, and Dave Mustaine, uh, and they moved into El Cerrito. Uh, but it was a house that was rented by Mark Whitaker, then manager of Exodus, and after Mustaine was removed from the lineup that same year, 
the Exodus guitarist Kurt Hammett would replace Dave Mustaine. Uh, and in turn, Mustaine would move back to Los Angeles to form Megadeth. But he formed Megadeth with a bunch of people from the Bay Area. Um, Burton and Hammett's uh, friendship with local acts, notably Oakland's Exodus and Testament, and later San Francisco's Death Angel, among others, strongly vitalized the scene, leading to intensive touring and tape trading that would cross borders and seas and eventually graduate to re record signing. Um, so, having said all that, basically, in one section of the East Bay, they were listening to these different metal sounds. Um, most notably, UFO, or UFO, um, and Saxon, which were these English new heavy metal bands. The scene in LA was more glam metal. You know, it, it had a lot of David Bowie in it, as it were, a lot of T-Rex. But what these bands wanted in San Francisco was a really hard sound. So Metallica also wanted this hard sound, and so they were working on this hard sound, but they couldn't get a gig in L.A. They go up to the East Bay to play Ruthie's Inn, which we'll talk about, um, and uh, this is where they meet up with Exodus and Testament and some of these other people. And then they decide they want a new bass player, so they recruit Cliff Burton. Cliff Burton's like, uh, you got to move up here. I'm not moving to L.A. This, this, this place is awesome. My mom lives here. So basically they moved in with Cliff Burton and his mom and eventually the Exodus house, um, which in one story, the Exodus house, quote unquote, um, because of the parties that these guys threw, eventually got down to uh, – um, <laughs> There was a toilet in the bathroom and a sink. There were no walls. It was all um, just um, two before. It was all just framed um, by the time these guys got done with it. Um, I think Exodus ended up having to pay to have the house redone after three or four years because they basically tore everything out because um, it was a party house, um, good or bad. Um, but yeah, basically destroyed this house. Uh, but yeah, so Metallica starts there. Um, so prior to moving back to California, uh, uh, Texas born Wesley K. Robinson was immersed in the jazz music scene back in the fifties and the sixties. While in the Army, he was immersed in the New York City jazz music scene uh, where he met musics like Pharaoh Sanders and John Coltrane. Robinson returned to the Bay Area in the early 60s, but in 1975, frustrated by the commercialism of jazz, Robinson focused on the Bay Area hardcore punk scene as well as the metal scene, and he opened up this club called Ruthie's Inn. Ruthie's Inn was uh, an older club. Uh, it was on San Pablo Avenue in Berkeley. And he wanted to present these bands because he knew that's what the kids were listening to. Um, Robinson was in his 50s when he started doing this. So you, know, you think, well, it's just what the kids are listening to. This guy was in his 50s, and he started Ruthie's In. He's like, yeah, this is what we need to do. So he started bringing in hardcore punk acts on one night and heavy metal acts on another night. And that's who played. But every once in a while – He'd have a jazz quartet at the same club, Ruthie's Inn. It, it's nuts. But from 82 to 88, the club was an early local venue for Metallica, Megadeth, Death, Slayer, Exodus, Possessed, Death Angel, Testament, Suicidal Tendencies, Violence, Forbidden, and DRI. Um... Cliff Burton was a regular at Ruthie's Inn. But – so all of this stuff is going on in this area. This is where basically Metallica comes in because I wanted to start with them because they're the most well-known. I would say that they are actually not the most representative of this sound, 
the most representative of the sound is actually Exodus. But we'll start with Metallica. The, the song I chose was Seek and Destroy off their first album, Chill Em All. I'm assuming you gave these songs a listen? I did. I have my notes. Okay. Let's talk about Kill Em All, Seek and, Dest- or Seek and Destroy off the album, Kill Em All. What did you think? So I've always liked Metallica. I like their sound. I, mm-hmm. It's it's strange. I guess I've never listened to this one from the very beginning. It has a very unusually long intro. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, um, that was interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, but this is this is Metallica when they're still trying to do thrash. They're still trying to keep up with these guys in the East Bay area. Because again, yeah, it wasn't. It, 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 it's not one of my favorites of their songs. Mm-hmm. Um, there was really good guitar solos. Solos. Uh, at the 319 mark. Yes. Um, that was really, first, really good. That was the first recording with Kurt Hammett. Interesting. Even though, even though uh, Dave Mustaine of Megadeth fame wrote part of the song, the, the guitar playing is actually Kurt Hammett. So this is the first time he did anything with them. It's a good song. It's not one of my favorites of theirs, but it's a good song. It is definitely a good song. There's a couple of other ones on there, but I, I thought this was – this song is more emblematic of what they were doing at the time. And again, mm-hmm. they got a little more polished and commercial as, as time went on. But I kind of like that intro. That's kind of my favorite. And I was within between this one and For Whom the Bell Tolls. Mm-hmm. I, I like For Whom the Bell Tolls better. Yeah. I <clears throat> Honestly, between you and me, I, I kind of do too. But I, I wanted to present – where the sound started, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So, yeah, they they were formed again in Los Angeles in 81. Um, but again, they couldn't get they couldn't they couldn't get booked in Los Angeles because everybody in Los Angeles was about Motley Crue and and you know, hair, hair bands. Yeah, hair bands, L.A. guns, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they did go into West Hollywood and, uh, to the Whiskey A Go Go, and they saw the band Trauma from again the East Bay area, and that's where they saw Cliff Burton, and they saw him using a wah wah pedal on his bass, and they were like, "Dude, we've never seen anybody do that." He's like, "What are you talking about? Everybody I know does that." which is how that kind of happened. Um, so, so yeah, uh, that, that's, that's kind of where that started. So, <clears throat> as you know, Dave Mustaine was in Metallica, and he eventually was kicked out, uh, they say mostly for his drinking, but James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich were really, really good friends since their early teenage years. And they basically agreed on the sound and everything else. The two of them butted heads with Dave Mustaine quite a bit. So that that's ultimately why he was dismissed from Metallica or quit, you know. Um, but he also – they also paid him for his songwriting royalties – you know, when the, his, the stuff that he helped write. Um, and so he goes back to L.A. Uh, and recruits a bunch of East Bay musicians from, like, Death Angel and Exodus and stuff like that to join his new band, which he calls Megadeth. Megadeth... Um, Made had this debut album, "Killing Is My Business" and "Business Is Good." It's good, um, but the next album they did, "Peace Sells," but who's buying? Has this punk rock undertone to it, almost like um, oh, uh, Motorhead. Mm-hmm. You know, you're mo- Motorhead. <clears throat> yes, that is a heavy metal song. It's got a punk backbeat on it. So does Peace Sells, But Who's Buying? And this was the song that me and the metal kids I knew could agree on. Because I was like, oh, yeah, that's great. I mean, and then in their next album, they end up doing a cover of the Sex Pistols' Anarchy in the UK, 
which was amazing. But for this point, I wanted to stress Megadeth's peace cells, but who's buying? Um, what did you think about this one? Uh, I wasn't a big fan of this one. I did I did uh, notate, though, that it really sounded like Twisted Sister took a lot from this one. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and a lot of, like, the new metal stuff. You'll hear that those opening riffs in a lot mm -hmm. of new metal stuff. Um, I This is my favorite Megadeth song. And again, I'm not a metal guy, you know. I I don't... I, don't, I mean, I, like I understand the hard driving stuff. I understand the the the, 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 the aggressiveness. It makes sense to me. It's a uh, just like the hardcore punks at the time. They were documenting the death of uh, the middle class in America. Not to get too political or socioeconomical, but that's what these things were. They were the documentation <clears throat> of the lower middle class becoming the poor. And if you look at it from that lens, heavy metal and hardcore punk make a hell of a lot more sense. Um, there's a lot of anger. You know, these promises you gave us weren't true, you know? And you hear that a lot with, as you mentioned, Twisted Sister. That's what that, that whole song, um, I keep wanting to say you got to fight for your right to party, but that's not it. It's, um, uh, Big twisted sister hit. What are you going to do with your life? Uh, uh, I want to. Uh, 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 I can't think of the title. I could probably say. Uh, damn it. Hold on. I'll find it. We're not going to take it. We're yeah. not going to take it. I had to get to the chorus. Um, the next band I want to talk about is Exodus. Exodus is the sound of the thrash metal in East Bay. Um, they are the progenitors of it and, um, probably the most famous band in the scene, outside the scene, the most famous band is Metallica inside it. It's Exodus. Um, they formed in 79 in Richmond, California. Again, there's a bunch of little towns North of Berkeley in Alameda County, Pine Hall, Richmond, El Cerrito. They're basically all right across the street from each other, essentially. Um, think of the mid-cities in DFW. Uh, their current lineup consists of guitarist Gary Holt and Lee Altus, bassist Jack Gibson, drummer Tom Hunting, and lead vocalist Steve Zetro Souza. Uh, there are no original members left in Exodus other than Hunting, who has departed from the band twice in 89 and 2004, but he rejoined in 2007. Exodus is also notable for including the then unknown Kurt Hammett, who was the band's lead guitarist from its inception to his departure in 1983 when he joined Metallica. Um, Holt, who replaced original guitarist T. Agnello in 81, has been the most consistent member throughout various lineup changes and breakups, and is the only member to appear on all Exodus recordings. Much of the band's career has been affected by bitter feuds between both band members and record companies. Two extended hiatuses, death of former band members, and internal problems, often related to drinking and drugs. Um, since its formation, Exodus has released 11 studio albums, two live albums, one compilation album, and a re-recording of their first album. Along with Metallica, they are often credited as pioneers of the Bay Area thrash metal scene. Um, Pavel Nicholas Baloff, or Paul Baloff. Uh, was an American singer best known for the original as the original lead vocalist of Exodus. He was fired from Exodus shortly after the release of the band's 1985 debut album, Bonded by Blood, and sang with various other bands before rejoining Exodus in 97. Uh, Bailoff died of a stroke in 2002. And then you, after that, you also get Zetro Souza. He's an American musician best known for his work as lead vocalist with Exodus from 86 to 94. And again, from 2002 to 2004, and he rejoined a third time in 2014. Susan is Souza is one of the two singers, along with Chuck Billy from the band Dublin Death Patrol. He also sings for the thrash metal band Tenet, and uh, for the thrash metal band Legacy, which is later known as Testament. So we'll talk about Testament as well. 
Um, but basically, Exodus was there at the beginning of the scene, and the song we're talking about is Bonded by Blood. They wrote this song because they were playing a gig at Ruthie's Inn, and someone threw a beer bottle on stage, and uh, Paul Bailoff cut his hand and because uh, he went to go pick something up and you know so his hand he's singing his hand is bleeding this teeny bopper girl comes up and goes i love you he takes his hand and rubs it down her face and leaves a bloody handprint on her face and he goes bonded by blood <laughs> and then there was a line of these young heavy metal girls who also wanted to get bonded by blood so they went home and wrote that song yeah yeah, so it literally bonded by blood. What did you think about Exodus's bonded by blood? Nope. Um, th this this song was not heavy metal. This was death metal. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a difference. Um, th the guitar solo in it was okay, but not great. But the, the my my biggest problem with this and my biggest problem with with death metal, it was just screaming and not singing you you can that's why I, I i prefer heavy metal over death metal because it's just screaming and, and and terrible thrashing i hated this song i hated it you hated this one yeah oh no i, I think you're gonna like the next one even less <laughs> but yeah they, these guys were indicative of that sound because it is hardcore um the next song is testament and C-O-T-L-O-D, Curse of the Legions of Death. Testament uh, is a band formed in Berkeley in 83 under the name Legacy. The band's current lineup comprises rhythm guitarist Eric Peterson, lead vocalist Chuck Billy, lead guitarist Alex Slotnick, bassist Steve DiGioro, and drummer Chris Dovan. Testament also has experienced many lineup changes over the years, um, including uh, Zetro Souza, um, when he would go back and forth to Exodus and, and Testament. Basically, Exodus and Testament are... <laughs> if, if you look at all the members, they're basically the same band. <laughs> um, but they are referred to as one of the big six of the Bay Area's thrash metal scene. You've got Testament, Exodus, Death Angel, Laz Rocket, Forbidden, and Violence. Testament is one of those, one of the biggies. Um, so, yeah, what did you think about Testament? No, you were right. It's just more death metal. I'm not a fan of this. <laughs> no. Uh, um, yeah, it's it. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely face melting. I, I'm with you. I'm not a huge fan of the death metal, but I can. Again, I I see where the anger is coming from. Um, and. Let's be honest. I think I've seen the the album cover <laughs> for this album on more T-shirts and posters in in high school kids' bedroom. This and the Death Angel one that we we're going to talk about. Um, it's the album covers for these heavy metal bands are the best. Even though I like the other scene more. I can agree. They have the best album covers. They really do. Their album covers are brilliant. Um, but yeah, the 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 song is pretty hardcore. I I like a little more humor, and it's yeah, there's no humor in this at all. The next one is Death Angel, Mistress of Pain. Um, I like Death Angel a little bit better. Um than Testament or Exodus. Um, I do like the Exodus. I, it's fun. Uh, again, I, I couldn't listen to it all day. But again, that Death Angel album cover, if you go and look at it, you, you'll see it on t-shirts and, and... What's weird is Death Angel is listened to by a lot of goth subculture. Death Angel has migrated into goth, even though the quote unquote goth sound is not metal at all. It's a it's more 
post-punk new wave sound, you know? But for some reason, Death Angel struck a chord with the goth kids. So you'll see that you'll hear the music and you'll see the posters and the t-shirts and things like that with the death, uh, with the, with the goth kids. What did you think about death angel mistress of pain? So it it started off promising. It really did. Um, and then the singer kicked in it's, it's off key. Um, it was just screaming and it, it not only was it screaming, but it was off key. <laughs> um, and let's go back to Metallica for a minute. Okay. You can have metal without just screaming your head off. Yes. Yes, you can. Metallica does that consistently. Yeah. I would say so does Megadeth. Um, it, it's just that 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 just incessant screaming and especially screaming off key on top of that. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it wouldn't have been as bad if he had just been on key. Uh, and it's still screaming, but it made it worse <laughs> being off key. I, it, it just a song like this just turns me off. Um. Okay, so the next uh, the next song is "Raining Blood" by Slayer. Now, Slayer, also an LA band, right? So Slayer comes. Slayer is playing the hardcore music, but they still dressed like the the hair metal guys. They go up to play a gig at Ruthie's Inn, and everybody loves their sound. But at the end of the show, everybody comes up to them and are like, um, you, you, need, you need to lose the, the – the, don't dress like Bon Jovi. Don't dress like Motley Crue. This is dumb. You guys are better than that. So after two or three shows up there, eventually Slayer stops dressing like Cinderella or Motley Crue, and then they just go on to – they're like, you know what? We could be harder than everybody else around here. And they did. Slayer? Slayer is one of those bands that is just hardcore. They sing about, uh, oh my God, uh, Satanism and hell and, and just, it's a lot of fun. It, <laughs> I like Slayer. Slayer is one of those bands that's like, hey, I can listen to them. I couldn't listen to them all day because it is way too aggro. I could probably listen to a album at a sitting. But I wanted to grab Raining Blood because I think it is indicative of the East Bay sound and it is indicative to what Slayer was trying to do after they got away from the hair metal stuff. You know, this is this is when they started wearing the the leather arm piece with the with the Ten penny nails sticking out of it, which I, I don't know how they play guitar with that. I mean, because you know those things are three or four inches long. You, granted, it's on their strumming hand, but how do they not? I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, this song will melt your face off. It is the third studio album by Slayer. It was released on October seventh, nineteen eighty six, by Def Jam. So. Death Jam at the time wasn't a major label. It is now, but when they released it, um, they got with Rick Rubin, and Rick Rubin's like, "Oh yeah, no, no, you got, you guys got to be all down for this." Um, it is considered one of the hundred greatest metal albums of all time. Rolling Stone magazine ranked Rain and Blood at, at number six, alongside Anthrax's "Among the Living," Megadeth's "Peace Sells But Who's Buying," and Metallica's "Master of." puppets the name of the song is raining blood the name of the album is raining blood this is slayer what did you think about raining blood well first i pulled up the album cover um since you mentioned about the album covers being really good and i and i pulled this one up and i i, I it's very interesting because i thought that this album cover cover was very hieronymus bosch yes um very very cool with that i i like the the artist hieronymus Bosch. if you have never checked out his stuff but please do it's really yeah, good stuff you should check out some uh, other sl yeah i think they actually used a bosch print in one of their albums interesting yeah um i did like the creepy opening of this one a whole lot um i loved it when the guitars kicked in uh, but then the singer comes on <laughs> you don't like thrash metal singing i don't like death metal i really don't i if this song was just music it would have been really good just stay with instrumentals um, they went to thrash at about the three minute mark. Yeah. And that yeah, was a long lead up on this one. Yeah. And that, 
I thought that I thought that movement into thrash was way out of place with the rest of the music. Okay. So. Yeah, but that lead up was was kind of nice. It's like yes. you, you could tell that somebody had been studying music theory. That's one of the reasons why everybody liked working with Cliff Burton because uh, uh, he had a degree in music theory. He's just you know, dude studied why sounds should be put here or there, mm-hmm. and that had an effect on this whole genre. Um, the next band is Blind Illusion. Now. Before we talk about Blind Illusion, I need to rewind back to what I said earlier that there were two bands that did a crossover. Blind Illusion is Primus. Okay. Blind Illusion is Primus with a heavy metal singer. Hmm. Rest of the band formed Primus when they stopped being Blind Illusion. And Kurt Hammett produced this album because Les Claypool and Kurt Hammett grew up together. Um, as a matter of fact, Kurt Hammett, he's not billed. He's billed as the producer. Some of the uh, guitar solos on Blind Illusions, I think it's their only album, because they went on to the, everybody else. They got tired of dealing with the heavy metal singer guy and decided to form Primus because they wanted it to be that crossover artist for the East Bay Area. Um, so Les Claypool and Larry Lalonde, um, they released their album, the Primus album, 1988, uh, The Sane Asylum. Bitterman eventually reformed Blind Illusion, uh, because it was, uh, Mark Bitterman was the lead guitarist and main songwriter and the singer, um, he formed this band with Kurt Hammett, Les Claypool, and Larry Lalonde. Uh, he reformed Blind Illusion in 2009, and they have since released two more albums, Demon Master and Wrath of the Gods. But before that, they released this one album, <laughs> Blood Shower. Uh, and it, uh, I, I wanted to include it because if you listen real close, you got to listen real close, you can hear Primus. Mm-hmm. You can hear Primus, and you can hear Kurt Hammett. And I thought Blood Shower was the most indicative of this this band, but I felt like I had to I had to show these guys because that's how you get the crossover. You know, that's how you end up with Primus or eventually the Donnas. But yeah, what did you think about uh, Blood Shower by Blind Illusion? Had a really good opening guitar riff. Um... But this is another one that I would have liked more if the singer wasn't in it. <laughs> uh, just stay with instrumentals and you're great. Right on. Right on. No, I'm with you. Yeah, the, the heavy metal singing kind of grates on the nerves. It's not heavy metal. That's death right. metal. Yeah, that's right. Death metal or thrash metal. Yes. Um, <clears throat> The next one is Phobophobia by Violence. Phobophobia... <laughs> Is the fear of fear. <laughs> I thought this sound, the name of this song was ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Phobophobia. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I think a lot of these thrash guys take themselves a little too seriously. And maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's where, where my digression is with these guys. <laughs> Um, they again formed in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, throughout its existence, they released demo tapes, one EP, and three studio albums. They, they're best known for their association with the Bay Area thrash metal scene, and often credited as one of the leading lights of the second wave of the genre, along with Pantera, Sepultura, Sacred Reich, Dark Angel, Annihilator, and Flotsam and Jetsam. Testament, Death Angel, and Forbidden. Uh, the band has also been referred to as one of the so-called Big Six Bay Area thrash metal bands. What did you think about Phobophobia off the album Eternal Nightmare? Uh, that's a trippy album cover. Very, very nightmarish. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so is the music. <laughs> but yeah, this is another one the singer ruined. It started off okay, and then I thought I could stay with it uh, until the singer came on. It just turned me off of the song. Yeah, Um 
the musicianship in these is is incredible. Um, the speed at which some of these guys can play, as well as their virtuosity, is unparalleled. They can't but, sing. Yeah, but most of them can't sing. You are correct. Um, Why would you listen to something where, so, where someone can't sing? Well, I mean, I like Bob Dylan, and he really <sighs> technically can't sing either. But there's a lot of heart behind it. <sighs> <laughs> So the next one is Laz Rocket. That's L-A-A-Z with little accent marks over the A, the A's, and then Rocket, R-O-C-K-I-T. And the name of the song is uh, uh, I've Got Time, and the name of the album is No Stranger to Danger. Laz Rocket is a lot more – to me, Laz Rocket is more heavy metal than thrash. You know what I mean? It it sounds it's not as it's not as hardcore, but it's a little more palatable. And uh, No Stranger to Danger is their second studio album, and it was released in 1985 on Target Records and Steam Hammer Records in Europe. Um, they again are considered one of the big six. What do you think about Laws Rocket? One word: awful. Uh-huh. Awful. You didn't like. You didn't like. I see. I figured you'd like Laws Rocket. I more. thought there was nothing redeeming about this one. I, I I'd rather eat my own head and stab <laughs> myself repeatedly with a spoon than listen to that song again. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So Awful. we're uh, um, <laughs> we're we're not giving that a kudos. No. Okay. The last song in our list is by Forbidden Evil, Chalice of Blood. Now. Forbidden Evil was originally the name of the band. They have since changed their name to Forbidden. So usually when you go to find this, it won't be under the band title Forbidden Evil. It will be under Forbidden. Uh, They are an American thrash metal band from San Francisco Bay. They formed in 85, and they changed their name in 87. Uh, Since their formation, Forbidden has broken up and reformed twice with numerous lineup changes. Um, The current lineup of the band is Norman Skinner, Craig LaCiriso, I murdered that. I'm sorry. Matt Camacho, Steve Smith, and Chris Contos. And again, along with Death Angel, Violence, Defiance, Testament, and Exodus, they're considered the great uh, <clears throat> the great pillars of thrash metal. Now, regarded by critics uh, as classic thrash metal album and their follow-up twisted into form, as something of a masterpiece within the tech thrash genre. Their early style was technical thrash metal, but the band later experimented with alternative and groove metal elements for the fourth album, Green. Green is a really, really great album. <clears throat> I like that album, but I like the groove metal sound because I like the the funk bass line they put in it. This is not present in Chalice of Blood. Chalice of Blood is a straight East Bay thrash metal sound what did you think about Forbidden in Chalice of Blood? Nope, just scream singing. <laughs> I, I, there's no actual singing. I, I, like, again, again, I go back to Metallica. You can have heavy metal and even thrash metal with Metallica and not just have to scream. Yeah. That's, that's, that's why Metallica is so great. They can, they can do metal but actually have someone in the, in the band who can actually sing versus just scream the whole time. This was, this was awful. So you were not a fan of this list? No. No. <laughs> At all? Other no. than the Metallica song? Right. Okay. So you wouldn't recommend this to anybody but, say, our buddy Greg? Yeah, I wouldn't at all, no. <laughs> I, there's some of these things that I like, but I, I'm kind of with you. I can't, I can't listen to this all day. I would rather listen to instrumentals from these guys. I'm with you. In some cases, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some of these guys are just virtually – their virtuosity is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, their precision, their timing, the way they lay the sounds, the, the, the their ideas of musical theory, just brilliant. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I don't like, I'm not a big fan of scream singing. And you know, later on, Metal Ghost gets away from scream singing and goes to the Cookie Monster lyrics. You know what Cookie Monster lyrics are, right? No. Okay, in the early... In the early 90s, all metal guys sang like this. Oh, okay. Like Cookie Monster. Right. Which I actually like better because, again, I'm with you. I'm not 
<laughs> if you're going to scream, don't do it off key. Exactly. And if you're going to be off key, don't scream. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. You, <laughs> you can do this without doing that. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, that's basically it for 118 in the East Bay heavy metal scene. In our YouTube playlist, I have also included a documentary, the full documentary on the East Bay music scene. It's at the beginning, so if you want to skip past that and just listen to the music, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend it. But <laughs> you don't recommend it at all. No. But if you want to understand how this 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 East Bay scene works, they do a serious deep dive that I I can't do here. <laughs> you know, so I would check that out uh, because some of the stories are really interesting. That's how I found out about the house. And uh, Cliff Burton's mom, who kind of took these guys in and uh, took care of them, um, you know, when they were not making any money. You know, you think Metallica, uh, these guys are millionaires. Yeah, yeah, when they first started out, they didn't have enough money to eat. You know, the reason that they didn't wear the heavy metal clothes is because they couldn't afford them. Or, you know, because they were all working day jobs. When they made Seek and Destroy, James Hetfield was still working construction. You know, and playing on the weekends and at night and never slept and rarely took a shower or got his clothes washed. So that's a, uh, you know, it was rough because nobody would play heavy metal on the radio. Or I'm sorry, death metal. No one would play death metal on the radio. Mm -hmm. Just like our next genre, 119. Thank you for going down that road with me. I appreciate it. I'm sorry for attacking you with scream singing. <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> it was painful. I, I made it through them all, but it was it was painful. I can't recommend that list <laughs> at all. I, I just okay. can't. Most of it most of it was just terrible. <laughs> terrible. You know what? We need to get Greg and see what he thinks about the list I put together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Good for Thanks them. A Thanks again, Greg. All right. Getting that out of my head, we'll step over to the murdery side of the house. Murder. For today, I got my information off the Las Vegas Sun, CBS News, Sacramento, uh, SF Gate, Wikipedia, Criminal Minds Wiki, and Medium. And this is the story of Gerald and Charlene Gallego. Gerald and Charlene Gallego. Or Gallego or Gallego, Gallego. I think it's Gallego. So. Gallego. We'll go with Gallego. <clears throat> Uh, Gerald Armand uh, Gallego and Charlene Adele Gallego were two American serial killers and rapists who were active mainly in Sacramento, California between 1978 and 1980. They murdered at least 11 victims, mostly teenagers, and they often kept them as sex slaves before killing them. Uh, and with that, they've sometimes been nicknamed the Love Slave Killers or the Gallego uh, Sex Slave Killers. Another couple. Huh. Mm hmm uh, Gerald Armand Gallego was, uh, it, sorry, Zig is referencing exclusive uh, 14 that we that we did. Uh, about oh, yeah. A couple, couple, yeah. Uh, Gerald Armand Gallego was born on July 17th, 1946 in Sacramento, California. His mother was a sex worker, while his estranged father was a criminal, who in 1955 became the first man executed in the Mississippi gas chamber. Wow. Got that for the killing of a police officer during a prison escape. Uh, during his formative years, his mother and her multiple boyfriends beat him constantly. Several, several of her clients even sexually abused him. Uh, he often begged to be hugged and was frequently left unclean and hungry. And at the age of 10, uh, Gallego was arrested for his first known felony offense, uh, robbing a neighbor's home, which was the start of his criminal career. Yeah. Here's, hey. another, here's another one. Yeah. Why don't we just go make us a serial killer? How do we do that? Well, let's see. Okay. We, beat we your kids. Feed. Yeah. Beat your kids. Beat your kids. Don't feed them. Don't show them any affection. Right. Right. Except for violence. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. It's a way to breed them. Yeah. That's right. That'll be good for society. Well, he had 23 arrests and served prison time after being convicted of robbery prior to his murders. Uh, he worked as a bartender and a truck driver, and he was married a total of seven times. 
including two marriages to the same woman, but he would often abandon his partners when they ran out of money. When Gerald was 12, he sexually abused a six-year-old girl, which resulted in him being sentenced to California's Youth Authority facility and would, during his adulthood, sexually molest his own daughter as well as one of her friends. And he was still married to a previous wife when he married Charlene. God. Yeah, not a great guy, is he? No. Uh, Charlene Gallego was born on October 10th, 1956 in Stockton, California. She was a smart, uh, shy child from a supportive home. Her father was a well-known businessman who served as the vice president of a chain of supermarkets. Uh, and as part of their professional lives, he and his wife frequently traveled. After Charlene's mother was severely injured in a car accident, Charlene took over her mother's responsibilities and started accompanying her father on his business travels, where he was frequently lauded by her, his, her father's clients for being an educated and articulate youngster. The trajectory of her life, though, began to change when, as a young adult, she started using drugs and alcohol and bragging to her friends about having a black lover. Because of her overly flirty behavior with her male co-worker, Charlene was despised at work and developed a reputation as an infomaniac. She wedded a wealthy young man who was addicted to heroin, who asserted that Charlene was desperate for a threesome with him, her, with him, her and a prostitute, because she was enamored with lesbian sex. Their marriage fell apart and they divorced because Charlene's first husband also detested the fact that Charlene's parents interfered in their relationship. Charlene's next husband was a soldier who Charlene described as a mother's boy, and she became bored with him and they separated. When Charlene asked whether they might have sex with his wife, the married man whom she was having an affair with, uh, their relationship ended quickly. She did attempt suicide after the breakup, but, she, but survived, and it was not long after that that she met Gerald. On September 10th, 1977, uh, Charlene met Gerald at a poker club in Sacramento, California, the 31-year-old Gerald walked into the poker club and laid eyes on a petite blonde named Charlene Williams, and he was instantly smitten. She was 10 years his junior. She looked like a schoolgirl, and it made him, which made her all the more alluring. And although they seemed as different as night and day, the horrifying truth of just how alike they were would su surface soon enough, leaving a trail of death and destruction that spanned three states. Wow. Within a week of their first encounter, Charlene moved in with Gerald. Uh, to Charlene, Gerald seemed streetwise and masterful. Uh, Charlene acted as the sexually subservient partner in their sadomasochistic relationship, although Charlene later claimed in court that she detested the painful experience. Uh, Gerald engaged in rough intercourse with her and particularly enjoyed sodomizing her. Charlene allegedly became enamored by his machismo and started partaking in his deviant fantasies. After they'd been living together for a few months, Gerald brought home a 16-year-old exotic dancer to Charlene. They had a threesome together. He made sure the two women didn't touch each other and only touched him. But afterwards, when he got home from work, he discovered the two women were having sex alone. He beat Charlene after throwing the dancer out an open window in wrath, and he refused to have intercourse with her, claiming he had lost his libido and became impotent. Charlene felt Gerald was sleeping with his patrons when he was working as a bartender because he had lost interest in having a sexual relationship with her. But after a year, he admitted that he required a pair of sex slaves to keep him excited. Charlene was asked to find them, and she obliged our respect for him and to gratify her, her own intense lesbian cravings. Uh, the Galegos targeted women. Their first victims were in their teens, but later ones were in their early 20s, while one was in her mid-30s. And more often than not, they abducted two at a time. They would abduct them from public or semi-public places, often at gunpoint with a 357 Magnum, with Charlene acting as a lure, take them into their van, where Gerald would rape them repeatedly before killing them in various ways, usually by shooting them uh, with a gun or bludgeoning them with some in incidental object. 16-year-old Sandra K. Butler was last seen in Sparks, Nevada on June 26, 1978, she had lived in California previously, but moved to Nevada with her mother. She attended Reed High School and went missing during her summer vacation. At 4th and Greenbra Greenbrae Streets, directly across from her family's apartment, she was last seen making her way to the Greenbrae Shopping Center, and she had not been seen or heard from since. She was seen as a probable runaway at the time of her disappearance, and police authorities took minimal action to conduct an investigation and track her down. 
Authorities believe that Sandra Butler was possibly Charlene and Gerald's first victim. Sandra had been given permission by her mother to ride her bike to the Reno Rodeo at the Washoe County Fairgrounds on the day she vanished, and it's known that the Gallegos were present there at the fair on that day. Gerald and Charlene were never interviewed by the police who were investigating Butler's disappearance, and neither ever confessed or were convicted of Sandra's supposed murder. Butler's remains have never been located, but there is suspicion of foul play. Uh, Sandra was five foot one, uh, five five foot to five foot one, around one hundred and ten pounds. She was a Caucasian female with light brown hair and sandy eyes, and brown eyes, and she would also known by the nickname Sandy. She would be sixty one years old in tw- in twenty twenty three. And one year after Sandra disappeared, on June 24, 1979, the Gallegos would kidnap two adolescent females from the Washoe County Fairgrounds in Reno, where Sandra was biking to one year earlier. Two adolescents, Kippy Vaught, 16, and Rhonda Scheffler, 17, vanished from a Sacramento mall on September 10, 1978. Charlene tricked them into going into the back of the couple's van as they were both shopping at the Sacramento, Sacramento County Club uh, country club plaza where the pair had then kidnapped him the girls were restrained by gerald after he threatened him with a firearm and the two victims were then repeatedly assaulted by him all throughout the night in baxter california the following day uh gerald and charlene drove to slow slow house california sloth house slow house uh where gerald off uh ordered Sh- uh, scheffler and Vaught out of the van he then forced them to cross the field into a ditch where he struck Vaught with a tire iron before swinging around and beating Scheffler. Finally, he pulled out a 25 caliber pistol and shot each girl once in the head. Vaught moved and made an attempt to flee as Gerald was leaving because the gunshot had only lightly grazed her skull, but she was killed when he went back and fired three more shots to, into her head. Charlene would later tell a cellmate how ecstatic she was during that particular crime. On June 24, 1979, 14-year-old Brenda Judd and 13-year-old Sandra Colley were abducted from the Washoe County Fair in Reno, Nevada. Both were persuaded to enter the Gallegos van with the promise of earning money by distributing flyers. On Interstate 80, Charlene took the van northeast of Reno, and as she watched in the rearview mirror, Gerald repeatedly sexually assaulted the two young girls in the back of the van. Charlene then parked their van in the remote Humboldt sink area, and over the next couple of hours, Gerald rested and watched Charlene force the girls to perform sexual acts on each other. Collie was then dragged towards a dry stream bed by Gerald after he removed a shovel from under the van's seat and yanked her out of the car. He then crept up behind Collie and repeatedly struck her in the head with a shovel. Charlene would later recall uh, in court of the assault, describing it as, quote, a loud splat like a flat rock hitting mud, and the girl sank to her knees and slowly toppled onto her face. After killing Judd, Gerald dug a large pit, placed the two girls' naked body inside of it, and covered it with a rock, or with rocks. The teenagers were listed as runaways for four years until Charlene confessed to their murders in their 1982 trial. Their remains were not found and identified until 20 years later in November of 1999 by a tractor operator who found them in a shallow grave off U.S. Highway 395 north of Reno, just inside neighboring Lassen County, California. On the morning of April 24, 1980, Gerald awoke Charlene and demanded, quote, I want a girl. Get up. After some time spent driving around, he came upon two teenage girls exiting a bookstore. That was Stacy Ann Redcan, Redican and Karen Chipman Twiggs, who were both 17 years old. On the pretext of smoking uh, some marijuana, Charlene approached the two males and uh, females and invited them to the van uh, to travel with her in the van. She led the girls back to the van, and they had in th- after they enthusiastically concurred. Gerald met the girls with a 357 Magnum pistol as they entered the back of the van, and he quickly commanded Charlene to drive in order the girls to undress. Gerald and Charlene took turns raping and sexually assaulting them, and after he finished, he, uh, he again had Charlene drive to a secluded area and led the girls one at a time into the woods carrying a hammer and a shovel. However, however this time he forced Charlene to, view the, uh, to, to dig the graves. She claimed that she saw movement, but Gerald insisted that both girls was dead were dead, then they left. 
And on July 27, 1980, picnickers discovered the coyote-ravaged remains of Karen and Stacy in two shallow graves in an area 20 miles uh, outside of Lovelock, Nevada. They had both been raped and suffered massive and fatal head injuries by a blunt instrument. While hitchhiking on June 6, 1980 in Port, uh, Port Orford, Oregon, 21-year-old Linda Teresa a Aguila was abducted, murdered with a blunt object, and buried in a shallow grave outside of Gold Beach, Oregon. Oregon. Uh, Teresa had accepted the Gal Galego's offer of a ride and was traveling with them in their van until Gerald threatened Teresa with a three fifty seven caliber revolver while Charlene was driving. Teresa was four months pregnant and mm. relatives reported her missing on June 20th. German tourists found her body two days later. The victim's wrist and ankles were bound with a nylon cord and her skull was broken, but an examination revealed she had been buried alive since sand had been found in her mouth, throat, and nose. Uh, Horrifying. I bet these people never came back to America after that. <clears throat> Horrifying. Yeah, the German tourists, I bet they never came back after that. Yeah, man. On July 17th, 1980, 31-year-old Virginia Mo Mochel uh, was abducted from the parking lot of a West Sacramento tavern where she worked as a bartender. Gerald and Charlene were acquainted with Mochel and had frequently been served drinks by her. She was sexually assaulted by Gerald, who then forced her to beg for her life, and after killing her by strangulation, he discarded her body by a pond. Her skeletal remains, still bound with nylon fishing line, were found three months later outside of Clarksburg. Loops of cord from the victim's neck were admitted as proof of death by strangulation. While leaving a fraternity party on November 1st, uh, 1980, 22-year-old 20 year Craig Miller and his fiancée, 21-year-old Mary Elizabeth Sowers, were forced into the Gallegos' car. Miller and Sowers were seen by the Gallegos standing by the side of the road. Gerald then ordered the two uh, into the automobile after getting out of the vehicle and approaching them directly while brandishing a 25 caliber Beretta. After taking them to a remote location, Gerald ordered Craig out of the car. And as he turned to approach the front of the car, Gerald pointed with his pistol at Miller and shot him in the back of the head while his fiance watched. Gerald then fired two more shots into Craig's head as he lay lifeless on the ground and his body would later be found near Bass Lake in California. Gerald got back into the vehicle and ordered Charlene to drive to their apartment. And once back at the apartment, Gerald took Sowers into the bedroom and raped her for hours. Afterwards, he ordered Charlene to drive to a rural era area in Placer County, California. And once there, Gerald ordered Mary out of the car and he shot her three times at point blank range. Um, a friend of Miller and Sowers witnessed the abduction and recorded the car's, uh, reported the car's license plate number. Police used this information to track down and arrest the Gallegos at a Western Union office. Uh, Charlene's parents were in the process of wiring her money. Gerald and Charlene pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnapping and murder, but Charlene's attorneys were eventually able to convince, uh, convince prosecutors in several states and counties to allow Charlene to testify against Gerald for a plea deal that reduced her prison sentence to 16 years and eight months. In June of 1983, Gerald was sentenced to death in California for the murder of Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller. In June of 1984, Gerald was convicted in Nevada for the murders of Karen Twiggs and Stacey Redican and subsequently sentenced to death. Uh, he was so revi uh, reviled that when it was learned that the impoverished county might not be able to afford the 60000 it needed to try him, a Sacramento newspaper columnist urged the public to send money to the county to help with the prosecution. Wow. More than $20,000 came roaring in, and $1, $5, and $10 bills, along with such bold stroke messages as, quote, may the trial be swift and the noose tight, and, quote, please purchase three bullets and shoot that bastard Gerald Gallego three times. Wow. Uh, legal experts said then that it appeared to be the nation's first murder prosecution to be partly financed by private contributions. <laughs> it's like PBS. I know, right? Um, in July of 1997, Charlene completed her sentence and, re and was released. Uh, while in prison, she extensively studied psychology, business, and Icelandic literature. Uh, during an interview, Charlene claimed that she was also a victim when she said, quote, there were victims who died and there were victims who lived. It's taken me a hell of a long time to realize I'm one of the ones who lived. 
She also claimed that she tried to save some of her lives, though. Oh, yeah. Um, she's now in her 50s. She's soft-spoken. She's focused on her future. If you ask her about the past, and she has a hard time saying her real name and uh, Gerald Gallego's name, uh, the man who had her kidnap girls for sexual fantasies, she's sticking with the story she told on the stand three decades ago, claiming it was all Gallego. She said, quote, he's just one sick bastard he was. I would have done anything if I could have stopped him. I know I couldn't have stopped him. I tried to stop him. And then she further said, quote, I put him on death row. Am I proud of that? Yes, I am. And at a final note, in 2002, Gerald Gallego died of cancer in a Nevada prison medical center while awaiting his execution. So that's the story of Gerald and Charlene Gallego. Well, thank you for that, sir. You bet. You betcha. Yeah, another another couple that I covered. Yes. So, as a matter of fact, it was because we recorded this back-to-back -back with the exclusive um, 14. It's another one where the female claims that she was the victim. Well, also and, a victim, yes. Yeah, not a, not not the actual... Not, not actually responsible, so... Yeah, we've come across a few of these now. Not just... Men, but we, uh, women, but men as well. Where, where they're, they claim that they were also a victim, but they got coerced into the, in you know, for fear of death or something. I don't know. Yeah. Like a Helsinki syndrome. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, all right. With that, that takes us to the end of another week of nerdery and murdery. Hope uh, you all appreciated that. Um, I didn't appreciate the, uh, the death metal at all. Uh, so. <laughs> Maybe you'll like the next list. So there is that. I have notes for that as well. Nice. I'm ready to go. Uh, as always, please don't forget to check out nerderymurder.com. That's our website, uh, the center for everything. Uh, you can find links to this episode along with pictures uh, of everything we talked about. And you can also find the link on our front page to our YouTube page that Zig spends a lot of time with. Yes, yes, I have made a YouTube playlist. Uh, eventually, this video will be included in the end of the YouTube playlist, uh, as well as the the uh, the documentary at the very opening, which I stress anybody to to watch, either before or after they listen to the list. Especially if you're into heavy metal, uh, kids, be careful. When I say this list will make will melt your face off, I need it. Awesome. Um, on our website, you can also find the link to our merchandise page where if you wish to show off your nerdery and murdery fandom, please do consider uh, purchasing some of the items we have there. Along with that, we do have the link to our Patreon where if you wish to become a donator to the show along with the merchandise, the our patrons do help keep this show going. There are costs associated with keeping this show on the air. It definitely doesn't uh, uh, fund our luxurious vacation, luxurious cars, and luxurious mansions that we all live in. So. It does not. No. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. And last but not least, please don't forget to leave a five-star review wherever you can. It helps us and helps others find our content that may be looking for the stuff that we're talking about. So with that... I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdery. Cue the music.